are you trying to say? What's the rate? One million bucks. Million dollar hit fee would draw some huge flies. He's not only essential to our case, he is our case. They're gonna pour boxes of bullets in Israel. They must not succeed. When do we get consigned? If an attempt is made on his life, it'll be made by those of the strictest professional caliber. Welcome to the Objective Skill Podcast. My name's Mike. Hi, I'm Emma. This is episode 37, Smoking Aces. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, Index Assassins, the new release uh, from Games Workshop via the White Dwarf for Warhammer 40,000. And more broadly, we're going to be talking about what um, these releases that we've seen, this is the second in two month, uh, three months, I should say, um, releasing army rules in White Dwarf might mean for the game going forward. Hmm. So um, it started in January with uh, the Crimson Fists release um, with uh, new rules and relics and so on and uh, yeah two months later in March of 2019 we got uh, Index Assassins Index Imperialis I think is the word they use for it isn't it? It is yes Assassins Index Imperialis Um, It's it's interesting that um, they've gone down the road and not called it a codex and um, this isn't the first time the Assassins have been in White Dwarf either Mm. the um, way back in third edition we had the very first Codex Assassins, and it was actually in as a separate bound book that you got with White Dwarf, mm. like a mini Codex, I think was the, the phrase they used at the time. So it's interesting to see the, the world turn full circle and have it back again attached to White Dwarf rather than in a separate publication. But before we get too much into that sort of stuff, um, we've got to cover a few other bits and pieces before we get into the topic. Do um, we? Yes, we do, because we've got show coming up. We do. Um, Coming up way too quickly. Tickets are on sale now via Humanitix. Mm-hmm. Uh, tickets for most of the formal events are on sale now. Um, and we are still working on workshops and um, panels and more information for everything, hopefully, basically. Hopefully by the time the next episode airs after this one, it'll all be ready and yeah, good to go. Uh, Claremont Showgrounds, uh, 1st, 2nd and 3rd of June. Silver 2019. Ju- 2019, Silver Jubilee Pavilion. So um, there's, I think, 19 different tournaments and counting at the moment. I'm we just, just added a new one today. Yeah, so plenty of stuff to do over the three-day long weekend. Um, plenty of parking, huge big space this year, all on one floor. Now, the only thing with parking is outside of our control, there is a $5 fee for parking if you park within Claremont Showgrounds. Yes, obviously street parking and um, parking outside of the showgrounds is free. Mm-hmm. Or oh, as well, sign posters. Yeah, I was going to say, check the sign posts. <laughs> um, but there is a, a fee per car going into Claremont Showgrounds that the, the showgrounds charges. But the showgrounds train station will actually be open. Yes. So it only opens for certain events over the year. Obviously, it opens for the Royal Show, um, but that's not this. That's not the same weekend no. that we'll be there. Um, but it will be open for the weekend that we'll yep. be there. So. so public transport is definitely an option. Mm. Or carpool with some mates and save the parking. Either way, you've got plenty of options in terms of um, getting to the showgrounds and joining us for show 2019. Yeah. It's shaping up to be quite exciting. We've significantly reduced our lead time, so it's been a little bit hairy, and it's about to get a lot hairier as we get the rest of the planning going. That's all right. We'll get the razor out. Mm. (laughs) I liked my pun. Don't look at me like that. Mm. Um, We've also got our first ITC event happening this coming weekend, um, First Blood Part 2. Tickets are still available if you haven't got them and you think, oh, I wouldn't mind getting in on that. Yeah, there's, um, I think there's still a half a dozen tickets available for it if you're keen to come along. Um, it's uh, Players Pack and all the rest of it are on the website and you can find it on Down Under Pairings as well. Mm-hmm. I think everyone's actually in Down Under Pairings now, but I've got to check today to see if there's, uh, there were a couple of lists missing yesterday that I chased up, so hopefully they're all in by now. Mm-hmm. Um, four games, one day, 
Um, just an option for WA players to try the first ITC event. We haven't run one here in WA before, so... Quick question, and I know I should know the answer to this, but if a player has loaded their own army list into Down Under Pairings, mm-hmm. can they see it? Yes, but they can only see theirs. Okay. The reason that I ask that is that we got a lot of people coming through saying, you know, you put the post out saying um, missing a few yep. army lists, and we got quite a few people saying, have you got mine, have you got mine, have you got mine? So... If you've loaded it and you can't see it, then no, we don't have yours. But if you've loaded it and you can see it, then you can pretty much say that, yes, we've yeah. got yours. As far as I'm aware, yes, that's mm. right. Okay. So the um, the software won't show lists until I make them public? No. Um, and which we won't do until we've got all the lists submitted, obviously. Mm. Um, and then uh, we're still hoping to squeeze one more event in in April, but April's a bit um, a bit busy with Easter and um, one of our children's birthdays as well. I was like, would have it. Her birthday is actually on Easter this year, so... Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, so we'll hopefully have something in April for everyone before we um, take a break in May to finish up everything we need to do and also head to Mount Easter. Gravatt yeah. to be part of the, um, the finale of the Australian GT heat series that they're doing um, at the new Warhammer... I don't know what they called it now. The, the Championship store? Yes, the championship store. Thank you. No problem. So we're heading over there um, as part of the Warhammer Heroes dinner, which, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we're, we're quite excited to go over. And, um, you know, it's actually going to be our first holiday with our kids in, what, 15 Ever. years? <laughs> so, since we've had children, yeah. this is the first time that we will have <laughs> Just been. Just the two of us. Yeah. And no, going to um, Albany as part of... Um, line breaker or heading to show for three days doesn't count. This is... No, it really doesn't. <laughs> this is actually going to be a break, which is nice. Well. Mostly a break. Yeah. So um, we're looking forward to though because um, they're going to do a bunch of previews, um, much like they did at LVO and like they like to do at some of the other big events around the world. So that'll be cool to be part of that. And we're going out for dinner with some of the Warhammer um, staff as well. Um, Andy Hoar, I think, was one of the names mentioned. And... It's going to be a, a full-on couple of days, so um, we might do some live stuff while we're over there from the store, so you can all check out the new Warhammer store that they've set up. Depending on whether or not Mike remembers to pack the gear this time. <laughs> it's been a bit whether of an they, issue. Whether they let us film in the store as well is another question. Mm, which means if we don't, it will definitely be because exactly. they don't let us and <laughs> nothing to do with Mike forgetting to pack the gear. I packed all the gear last time. It was just the tripod. Everything it's else was there. Quite a significant thing to forget, don't you think? Oh, we're being picky now. I have to try and remember it for this weekend. Mm. <laughs> if I tell you now, then you have to remember it as well. No, I don't. Nope. Right. Fair enough. That's then. on you. <laughs> um, we've had more uh, Shadow Spear um, previews, and uh, they got for pre- the game mm. actually goes up for pre-order this weekend for forty k, which is exciting. And they've also previewed. They're at a toy fair in I think it's New York at the moment, Games Workshop, and mm. they're previewing new stuff. So there's um, the new uh, corn. Um, Age of Sigmar range, so we've got the the new term terrain piece, which is this big bloody altar and looks really cool. And there's the new I can't believe they're not endless spell spells. Um, so it's uh, it's really shaping up over the next couple of months for them to just a huge wave of releases. We've obviously seen Abaddon now as well, so he's um, apparently going to go up for pre order by the end of the month, which um, sadly ruins the chances of me having it for uh, this weekend for the raffle prize, mm. but. Um, yeah, that was the plan, wasn't it? Yeah, well, we hadn't. I mean, the, the countdown. We were hoping that when they sort of formally released it, it'd go mm. for pre-order. But sadly, that hasn't happened. Shame. Um, I'm sure he will make an appearance at a future event as a raffle prize because um, it's just a cool model, huge as well. Yeah, maybe the April event. Well, I suppose it depends. That on we the... haven't planned yet. No. <laughs> Perfect. Um, what else have we got going on? That's a really good question. My life is completely revolving and evolving around shows. So, outside of that, I haven't got much. Did mm. you? Did we talk on the last episode about the Beyond Games event that you went down to? Yes, we did. Right. Okay. Well, we won't talk about that. Beyond then. Games was awesome. It was a really good weekend. Um, we've got um, a whole bunch of um, the Notcron terrain here mm. now, which I haven't, which you knocked over when I was mucking about with it. No, 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 no. Those yeah, yeah, are two yeah. separate things. You left a pile of... I did not pile. They were built. They weren't glued. They weren't they were... built. You stacked them bits on top not, of each other. That's the way they go together. Yes, I know. But you hadn't built them. You just placed the bits on top of each other and I... then left them 
precariously they balanced. They were not precariously balanced. On a box. They were not. That I happened to walk past as I was trying to get a game out, given this is our children's playroom, <sighs> and I was trying to get a game for our children off the shelves that holds the so board is, games. This is a likely story. Yes, and they got knocked over. <laughs> Could have just as easily been by the dog's tail. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> by my leg. So, um, I've, been mm. re- I've been reliably my told... My plan is that while I'm at my conference for the next two days, you can build all that. Oh, good. Hmm. Lucky me. I know. You were supposed to build it last week. I didn't. know, but I'm a bit torn with it because we want to wire it up with LEDs and particularly those big um, plinths, those big towers. Pyramids, yeah. Uh, not, not, not so much pyramids. the tower, but the, the big monoliths, the big yeah. sort of tall towery things. The images on the website don't really do it justice because they're freaking huge. And um, the way they're designed, having played with them, I think they're actually meant to come apart. Then you know, like You're not meant to glue them together so you can put those little tea light candles inside it. Mm. The problem with that, of course, is that they fall apart really easily if you knock the table or knock... Having to walk too close into yeah. the box they're precariously balanced on. Anyway, so I feel like they have to be at least partly glued together. They're not really big enough for magnets because of the way they're, like the way they're designed to join up. Mm. So you've either got to kind of wire it all together and put the LEDs in up front and then kind of like run the LEDs in between each piece and then glue all the pieces together around them. Mm. Um, or at least do it in parts. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to do that at the moment. Mm-hmm. But they're they're here now, and since I've just been given permission to actually build them, <laughs> you've been given two days to get it done. I'll get it done tomorrow. Mm. It'll be fine. I'll even share pictures on it when I, as I'm building them. With me while I'm at my conference, or with other people? Well, I'll share them publicly, and then since you're at a conference, then um, that's okay. Right. <laughs> but that's exciting because. Um, it's uh, it's we've got the map here. We've now got all the terrain here, so yeah, um, it's another new cool board that we're going to have for show at the very very latest. But yeah, fingers crossed. You get it done. You can take it for this Sunday. Look, if I can get it all assembled tomorrow and then hit it with um, undercoat and whatnot on the Thursday, and mm. I've got the metallic black paint sitting here and ready, so you never know. We might have it in a some semblance of usable. It probably won't be lit up by then, but it should be um, it should be serviceable you can for the get day. Get some tea lights for it. Yeah, I suppose. Anyway, so that's really exciting for us. Um, and then, um, other than that, I think we've um, we've basically spent all our time on show. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. we've got some new workshops happening this year. Yep. Um, we're looking at seeing um, whether or not we can get someone to run something specifically for kids so that they can jump in and jump out of some... Um, Mon- Monster Mash. Like a Monster Mash version of Simple Hammer. Kings really? Of, Kings of Tokyo is my, my favourite analogy. Yeah. I didn't really necessarily see the similarities. Well, but it's it's playing with big monsters, rolling dice, beating each other up. Mm. I don't know. That was my thought process anyway. Yeah. And most of the players' packs are now well underway, so we should have those out shortly as well for sure. Two are up. Yeah, the Blood Bowl ones are both ready. Yep. The 40k ones I know are almost done. The Age of Sigma draft's done. Um, the Bolt actions are almost done. I'm sure there's more games. The Grand Clash, I don't have to do. Um, Starting to get some um, sponsorship in as well. So we've got um, some sponsorship come through for Kings of War event. This is the first time that we'll have run a Kings of War event as well. Yep, Mantic have already jumped in and said yes. That's quite exciting. And it's it's exciting for us to have new games and new systems and um, I guess new versions of systems that we've run before. So like Bolt Action, there'll be the standard Bolt Action game if you can call it standard. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there'll be a... I don't even want to use the word regular, but there'll be a bolt action game and then the following day will be a Tank Wars yeah. game as well. So, I'm also, something a little bit different. We haven't run that before. I'd also love to see, maybe next year, not this year, um, Conflict 47. Yeah. Um, which is the weird World War Two version of bolt action, which could be a really fun game to run. But we know that three the club, days of bolt action. Yeah, we know that the club I'd crit that will be um, demoing and doing some intro games for Conflict Forty Seven. So among other games, yeah, yeah. That, but it's one of the games that they'll be doing. So if people are interested in it, they want to come and have a look at it, or you know, try Grave it out. tanks and robots in World War Two. Hmm. So interesting, um, interesting mix, certainly. Yeah. I think it's probably as close as I'll get to playing any of the World War Two style games if I were to dive into it. Mm. But I was 
I was talking to somebody who said that apparently when men get to, and these are his words, when men get to a certain age, they all feel the need to start playing World War II <laughs> games. And um, so I'm not sure what that certain age is, but I guess if you're saying that, then you haven't reached it yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see Fair whether enough. or not that certain age comes from. No, I think that's just being a big kid. I'm not sure it's about being a big kid. I think that, I think it's a little bit different for the World War Two stuff. Mm, I suppose. Yeah. Anyway, um, we're going to head back right to the start of this conversation to talk about the... Um, Assassin's Index Imperialis. Yes, but we're going to firstly quickly cover, the, like I said earlier, the release in the, code, uh, in the White Dwarf and what that could mean for future releases. Because essentially the codexes are done now. All of the, all of the main codexes that were released... Um, so we got the preview versions or the, the basic versions in the in, uh, four index books now have proper codexes. Mm. So all the Chaos ones are available, all the Imperial armies are now available, the Eldar, Necrons, Orcs, Tau, everyone's got their own codex. Um, what's interesting is that each of those indexes still has a handful of... They're not, they're not um, worthy of a codex, but they're also not part of any of the existing indexes. So I'm not talking about units like... Um, the Autark with Warp Jump Generator who is in the Index but not in the Codex. I'm talking about units that exist outside of their Codex entries entirely. So for the Space Marines, it's things like Legion of the Damned. For the Imperium Book 2, we're talking about the Inquisition and the Inquisition uh, Bodyguards. We're also talking about uh, Sisters of Silence and up until this White Dwarf, the Assassins were in that, that group as well. Mm. In Book... Th um, uh, Xenos 1, you've still got the Anari, the three characters for the Anari faction of Eldar. Um, I actually think Xenos 2 doesn't have anything in it these days because that's where the Tau, the Necrons, the Gene Steel Cult, Tyranids... I actually think book two, Index Book 2 for the Xenos is now essentially defunct. Mm -hmm. And the Chaos Book still has the rules for the Emperor's Children and uh, World Eaters sort of wrapped up in that sort of indexy space um, outside of its codex. So I'm wondering whether or not Games Workshop are just going to use the White Dwarf and using the Assassins as a kind of a litmus test to go, you know what, we want to get rid of these index books. Selling them now, obviously the sales on them was probably non-existent or very, very low because people entering the game aren't going to have any of the historic units. Yeah. So the value of them has dropped dramatically particularly over the last 12 months and now with Gene Steeler Colt they're essentially non you know of no value which could finally see them cancel the indexes I had someone tell me that they're not actually available for down digital download on iTunes anymore mm. which is interesting um, and I know that the stores don't tend to stock them anymore either so we could be in a process where they start just quietly you know every second month releasing a, a 40k in this case it was Index Imperialis Assassins um, it'd be easy for them in May to turn around and go, oh, here's um, Index Enari, and here's the updated rules, all the FAQs rolled into one entry, here's the new rules for the Enari, here's, here's your models, go for it, and slowly phase out those indexes. And I know that um, I'll get plenty of hate for saying that I can't wait for them to do that. You said it last time. I don't think we need to go over it again. But yeah. If you missed the last episode, there's like there's a, a, there's a, there's a 10 minute rant of him yeah. going on about why that's a good thing. <laughs> okay. So rather than go over that again, just go back and listen to that episode. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's interesting that they're actually going back to releasing rules in the White Dwarf is my point. Yeah, I know. Um what I'm wondering is logistically, what is this going to mean? Is this going to mean that people are going to be carting around... White Dwarves, yeah. yeah. I would hope that going forward, obviously they're not going to do it straight away, but you can do digital downloads of White Dwarf. You can pay a subscription and do the digital yeah. version. Um, I wouldn't put it past them to turn around and um, like the um, Chaos Knights got a digital release, free download, and mm. it was the whole codex. Yeah. Well, four pages of it or whatever it was. Mm. And I could see them maybe turning around in three months' time when you can't buy the White Dwarf in stores anymore? Yeah. Well, that's exactly it. If you can't get the White Dwarf, how do you get it? Yeah. Um, I would expect them to turn around and go, here's your, you know, here's mm -hmm. your free Codex Assassins download type thing. Um, obviously, they're not going to come out and say they're doing that, though, because they want to sell the White Dwarf. Yeah. Um, and I would assume it's going to take, like I say, three to six months before they do it. Mm. I could be wrong. It could, could happen immediately upon the April release of White Dwarf, but I'm not holding my breath. Short term, though, you know, for events, you can always use the scanning app as well the scanning little option as part of notes app so that you can have it on your 
iPad or something like that. Oh, look, I think... You're not having to cart around with... Oh, look, the... But between Battlescribe, which I still don't support yeah, as an option it. for rules, um, and the internet, the, the whole White Dwarf articles and everything with the full stats and entries and points and stratagems yeah, are lurking around available. online. Um, they're not necessarily legitimately available, but they're available. Well, in that case, we don't support non-legitimate um, downloads. The, the easiest way is to literally... anybody's listening to it there. <laughs> the easiest way is literally just go... If you want it digitally, just go and buy that White Dwarf as a digital download onto your iTunes account or onto your... Um, Google account. Yeah. But um, why don't we actually start talking assassins? Um, this is this is kind of a test bed, I suppose, this episode as a um, codex review because we haven't done a proper review of uh, any of the codexes as part of our podcast. So this is a nice, easy one to kick off with and we'll... Might be a nice, easy one. I think I've still got 12 pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, we're going to have a quick break and we're going to jump into the topic on Imperial Assassins. We're back. Did you miss us? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they did over that, um, I don't know, I think it's 15 seconds of um, break and it's purely for my editing purposes, I guess. It's a long time. <laughs> they could have missed us. <laughs> All right. So, we're talking about Assassin's Index Imperialis, which is in White Dwarf number... Um, do they have numbers? I don't know if they have numbers anymore. Hang on. It's March 2019. I can't see a number on it. Oh, well. It's in White Dwarf March 2019. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really weird. I've never noticed that. Maybe there's one on the inside cover. I should probably have looked at this before. You kind of sprung that on me. Yeah, sorry about that. You do that to me all the time. Oh, here we go. Issue number, volume three, number 31. Oh, that's... Interesting. That's what it says in the um, inside here. See, just here. Hmm. Anyway, um, so there you go, for whatever that's worth. I'm sure that you can mail order it by looking for March 2019 instead. Yeah, I think that might be easier rather than... Um, yeah, so... Issue and volume. Stuck hidden within the... About halfway through, it's around page 80 of The White Dwarf. Mm -hmm. um, we get our first well, proper index slash codex release for White Dwarf. For 8th edition, at least. Mm -hmm. And um, I tell you what, since um, you're the relative 40k newbie, why don't you kick it off? By telling you that there are four pages of generic background, who they are and giving a brief history. Yep. There you go. <laughs> so, it starts with four pages of generic background. <laughs> I, I suppose, like, a lot of the, the background in this, um, it's expanding on, like, when we first saw Assassins released way back in, in tail end of second, I think it was. We got like a paragraph for each assassin, mm. and that's expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded to the point now where we've got it's two pages for well, each assassin well, that's individually, it. and then four pages of sort of the the bulk of the stories and who they are and what they do, and yeah. um, there's little um, little sidebars about sin skin and you know some of the weird weird wonderful generic war gear they all get. So the fact that they've actually taken the time there's a lot of this that's actually new as well having read it and there's a lot that seems well not there's not a lot but it, um i guess when we were reading it we when we we're looking at the historical timeline of events yeah it seems as though they've almost rewritten some of that yeah, history there's so, definitely some new stuff in there as well which is always nice and some stuff that has been left out which is an interest is interesting that they've chosen to exclude the execution team where the assassins were um, deployed against the Tau. And that's, I guess we'd assumed that that would be mentioned, and well, yet that it was, hasn't been. Yeah, that was a huge part of 7th edition. Um, I think it was the Mont Car campaign book. There was Kay Yun and Mont Car back to back. Mm. And they deploy the execution force, uh, one of each of the four primary assassins, out to kill the command structure of the Tau. And um, only one of the assassins succeeds. But um, that's but that assassin manages to be successful and kills Unvar. So yeah, which was a, a big pivotal point. Yeah, in the in the books, and obviously the the death of Unvar is mentioned in the Tau Codex. It's mentioned in well, passing, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. Where you got pages and pages of it in the campaign book, but it's not mentioned here in the timeline at all. Hmm. Um, and there's a lot of new stuff that's been added here. There's the, like. Um, the death of Conrad Kurz is mentioned in very, very brief passing, which has been a staple of the Horus Heresy for a long time now. 
Um, my favourite story here is Mother Gullet, a Calidus assassin that um, goes in and steals the firstborn child of a planetary governor, disguises herself as the matron, and then swallows the princeling whole and walks out carrying the baby in her gullet and then spews it back up later. And they, um, the governor falls back into line. So Through Black Knight. Yeah. So um, I thought that was kind of cool that it's it kind of showed another side of the assassin that wasn't just a go in and murder everyone. It was a, mm. a tactical tool as much as anything else. Um, a lot of the stories there certainly paint them as these um, heroic military warriors who kind of do some amazing things. There is one section here that... Um, uh, I'll see if I can find it. They accidentally deploy more than one assassin. And um, there's a, a quote about it being, um, you know, such a... Uh, you know, this this is why we don't do this stuff. Because, um, yeah, everyone dies. They like they kill the whole planet. Aww. Um, through an accident of um, administrative error. So... Um, yeah, interesting. Um, what's really cool is they've updated all the artwork as well. Yeah, so there is obviously artwork for each of the four models. Um, and sorry, did you want to say? No, no. Um, so the the artwork, um, what I really like is they've, up, like you say, they've updated the artwork for the four models and the artwork now reflects the current model range. Yeah, and that same model range is the models that were featured and released in the box game Execution Force. Yeah, so that, I think that was... Uh, it was at least before 2016. It might have been 2015 or 2016. So it would have been either late 6th or early 7th edition 40K when those models were re-released. I couldn't, I couldn't be certain off the top of my head. So they haven't actually... They haven't changed the models in any way or... No, the, the current models are, have been around now for four or five years at least. Yeah. Um, Execution Force was great because at the time the box was $180, $190 Australian, I'm talking at this point. So if you're listening from somewhere else in the world, you don't need to freak out. Um, and at the time they released the Assassins, they came out here in Australia as $50 each. Mm. Which meant to get the four Assassins in the box game plus the Chaos... Plus the game. Plus the game itself yeah. was actually cheaper than buying the four Assassins. Um I checked it today. Those assassins are fifty three Australian dollars each in a, a clam pack at the moment, and two of them are out of stock. Mm. <laughs> no surprises there. But um, so, with you talking about the artwork, um, there are so obviously it goes through, and there's different pictures and artwork and design for each of them. There's also two pages of studio work. Yeah, the um, the studio models that they painted. Um, so that that sort of comes right towards the end of the article. Um, You're flicking backwards and forwards, so am I. <laughs> uh, called Agents of Death is the heading, and they basically go through the um, members of the studio team having painted them in a variety of colour schemes. So um, you've got Chris Peach, Joel Martin. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. There is one conversion that I found in the group, which was the Eversor Assassin by Maxime Corbeil. Oh, I can't even... Maxime Cor- Corbeil? Yeah, I'd Corbeil? Say Cor- I'd say Corbeil. Corbeil. Um is there's a face swap or a head, head sw- swap? Yeah. I'm try- I don't know whether it's a head swap or a face swap or maybe even from the old metal Eversaur assassin. Um, it's definitely a different skull shape. Yeah, it's definitely a different face. So, um, whereas all the others appear to be standard at glance. Um, we were talking about models. Your favourite's the Calidus, though. Yeah, definitely. She's um, an interesting model. It's so dainty. And um, there's so many points when you build this model. There's two cables that run from her weapons into a, like a backpack power yeah. pack. It's so fine and fiddly that the amount of people that cut, have to cut them off because they snap trying to take yeah. them off the sprue. Um, it's a bit fiddly. The Eversor Assassin also has a needle pistol and big needle claws, which are obviously another weak point of that model for snapping. Although him running up the side of the wall is pretty cool. Mm. I, my Out of the artwork that's on here, I definitely prefer the Chris Peach version. Oh, the so the this is the one on page ninety eight of the White Dwarf. So it's mm. like a a teal grey with red accents on the the body and down the legs and the hair. It's a, definitely a vibrant one uh, in terms of what's here. There's a uh, Vindicare Assassin by Chris Merrick done in snow, like an Arctic camo scheme, which is pretty cool. And I really like Joel Martin's take because all four of them kind of match up and they're that teal blue colour, which is really nice. Um, I'm waiting for it. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure someone can paint these up as Deadpool's. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, so, Calidus is my favourite model out of those four that are there. And interesting, when we were first looking at it, kind of one of the first comments that you had, which is 
the next page over, um, was, oh, she's very booby. Yeah, the artwork has done nothing to... Um, Diminish her assets. No. <laughs> and so... She does have... Like, when you look at her, she's got quite a narrow waist, mm. very large thighs and hips. Mm. Um, she's still quite perky. But, <laughs> well, you know what? That's one of the benefits of having breastplates is that it does lift and separate. So... <laughs> I'm um, so glad you said that, not me. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm allowed to say that, whereas it would be no. completely inappropriate <laughs> if you said it. So now I'm going to say something that's completely inappropriate. What I'm wondering is there seems to be – I'm not sure whether or not I'm hearing more of the issues around breastplates and breast armour because people are bringing it to my attention because they're expecting me to be upset by it or they're wanting to run it past me because, you know, they want to know – how should they be feeling about it? Because if I'm insulted, then they want to be insulted on my behalf or, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not sure whether or not it is as big an issue as as I'm experiencing because people keep talking to me about it. Yeah. But what I did notice with the other four models... Three. Sorry, the other three models out of the four is they all have significant cod pieces. <laughs> so I'm wondering why that doesn't ever seem to be mentioned. Well, certainly the guys don't, like... As so, a, I'm bringing a, it up. As a bloke, I'm saying, no, it doesn't even register as an issue or a non-issue. And that's the same thing with the, you know, with the breastplates for me. It's just a complete non-issue. And and I also think the reason that, the reason that I would imagine that these are sculpted the way they are and not like a Ken doll is because the reality is that there has to be space there. Yeah. <laughs> in order to accommodate. Well, the same thing goes for boobs. That is true. All right. That's all I want to say on it, and I promise not well, to mention I'm, it again. I'm going to show you a slightly different piece of artwork. This is the artwork from okay, the front I might of the, mention it again yeah, there. <laughs> the execution box. So, there's the calidus there. Now, the, the artwork I'm talking about, which I'll try and put in the show notes, is actually in the... Um, uh, Richard uh, published an article on the assassins on the website. If you head to yes. objectivesecured.com.au, mm-hmm. you can find the article there. The picture is in there as well. It's the four assassins side by side, and the calidus is third from the left. And her proportions in that piece of artwork... Significantly different to the one a couple of pages after. Far less pronounced. It's a similar pose, but the... um, Mm, It's not really a similar pose. Arms up, bent leg, straight leg. It is is very similar. I'm going to do something that only you will be able to see, which is completely PC and PG, but I'm not going to have a photo and put it in there. But I want you to see the difference. So she's standing up. Right? Yep. Which is this one here. Yep. Straight on. What difference does that make? Yeah, okay. So essentially we're talking about a torso twist where the, the artwork angle makes a big difference. Yeah, the artwork of the execution box is a lot more front on. Oh, I suppose it's a little bit more front on. It's a lot more front on and yeah, that does make a big difference. Um but yeah, it's it's interesting that there is that discrepancy sort of artwork to artwork, when you actually look at the miniature itself, um, she's not especially hugely well endowed. She's um, obviously got boobs and she's not wearing armour, I should point out. It is actually just like a body suit. So um, the model itself isn't like ludicrously proportioned, no. I, don't, I don't think. No. But um, all of the men, like you say, with the cod pieces, when you actually look at the miniatures and how they're highlighted in particular... Mm. Yep. Um, <laughs> it gets interesting. Yeah. Well, I noticed it. Yeah. So, <laughs> it was obviously interesting enough for me to go, oh, well, hold on a minute. What's What's even funnier is they actually tell you um, the painting um, paint splatter actually tells you how to paint the um, the armor or yeah. the, the sin skin, I should say. And if you have a look at step three of painting the black sin skin, that's, um, there, there's highlights in the groin area there for that uh, Vindicare. So... Yeah, and that is so. There are two pages there where there is paint splatter, so um, some painting basics, and it is specific to the Vindicare. Yep. But these are transferable skills. Oh, absolutely. So they're transferable not only across the other three assassins, but across, you know, pretty much. Yeah, if you if you want a sort of a midnight clad hunter, whether mm. it's an imperial assassin or whether it's an elder ranger or maybe the sanctus assassin from. Uh, the Gene Stiller cults or anything that sort of sneaky character, the the paint stuff here is actually pretty good. There are there were days when this would have come out in second or third edition where the articles they did for painting went, oh, do this, then do this, and then you get this golden demon winning yeah. awesomeness. 
these steps are getting better and better each time where they actually go through and you can see the progression of them. Mm. Um, so they actually feel like they're achievable now. I'd still like to see something that focuses on how to actually clean models and start from scratch. Yeah, we don't get too much of that these days. No. Um, the white dwarfs tend to focus on what's in them and how to do what's in them yeah. rather than anything else. Anyway, um, so we're going to move on to um, the actual rules component of it. So there's only... So there's four pages of general rules. Yeah, so we've got um, the four data sheets on two pages and then we've got the um, how to use them in an army, their um, common rules and then the stratagems and then we've got to fill a filler picture um, because clearly they didn't have quite enough for, the, <laughs> for that page of rules. So we've got a, a little filler space of um, the assassins versus some um, Simhain. Um, Sears. Um, so yeah, the there have been some significant changes from index to index. <laughs> yep. Um, but there's um, what's most interesting to me is how um, how you include them in armies now because I feel like there's opportunities and one of them is completely worthless. Um, okay, well we'll we'll get to that in a minute. So first of all, so we've got the four pages of generic rules. Yep. And then there's a two page spread per assassin. Yep. So there's four assassins. So the Vindicare is the sniper. Yep. Calidus is the shapeshifter. Yep. Eversaw is the berserker, mass troop killer, most gruesome. Yeah, he's um he's the the butcher. I suppose is a good analogy. He's oh nice. Yep. And then not pleasant individual. No. Drug fueled killing machine. And then Calexus is the anti psycho assassin. Yeah. And um, with psychic blanks. Yeah. So she's, he, it yep. is, um, the way they describe it is particularly cool when um, when one of them enters the room, even if you're not uh, a psyker, you feel cold, you um, you feel uneasy, you get chills. Like it's it's a disturbing place to be because the, um, the Imperium sees them as soulless. So they, they don't have any it's sort of... Dementor. Yes. <laughs> But these were around before Dementors. Before Dementors. So, so maybe this okay. is where she got it from. <laughs> um, so I, I can't believe I missed that analogy. There you go. <laughs> this is why you need people who are... <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter nerds. Yeah, totally. Um, did you want to talk about how that can possibly work well against... Um, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I've forgotten what it's called. Elder. Is it Elder? Yeah. Yep. Oh, the... the um, the Calexus is the, the, certainly the assassin of choice when it comes to um, dealing with any of the psychic armies. There's actually a story um, in the White Dwarf about, um, I think it's part of the timeline, where there's a, uh, a Calexus that literally just wanders in to a craft world and because they because it's so psychic, they can't see it. And it just kind of... Um, Calexus' assassin is sent to claim the head of a manipulative Farseer. The Eldar senses the threat and scries the skines of fate accordingly, but is increasingly alarmed to find it he is unable to locate the thread corresponding to his pursuer. Um, after a long and terrifying hunt, the assassin ambushes his prey in the lonely halls of Saim Hunt's Dome of Reflection. Rendered, rendered psychically inert and driven to exhaustion by the chase, the Farseer literally just gives up and lets himself be killed. Oh, and, that's um, a bit sad. <laughs> So, before we do move on to um, looking at the ways to actually get them into an army, it's probably useful to talk about the fact that they're now all 85 points each and the same um, power level as well. Yeah, they, um, they've gone ahead and balanced them all out and I'm assuming this is partly... It certainly is not reflected in their stats and rules because there's some clear better choices than others, but by making them all... Not necessarily better choices, but they're, there are some differences in their... Well, three of them came down in points and one went up. Mm. Um, but by making them all the same points per model, that kind of ties into one of the stratagems, um, particularly for match play where you do have to spend reinforcement points alongside CPs to make this stratagem work. Mm. So by making them all 85 points, it naturally makes that stratagem work regardless of your choices. Mm. So the fact they are all equal now um, just, just makes the bookkeeping side of the of using them much easier. Yeah, and which I guess is useful for the person who's playing them, but also really useful for your opponent as well. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, it, it certainly means that um, you can keep your opponent on your toes because... Oh, no, I actually think the other way around. Because if they're all 85 points, then it's easy to know that... Oh, yeah, no, I suppose the TO checks, what, checks the army list. And well, the army anyway. list is just going to say reinforcement points 85. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Um, okay, so there are three different ways to get them into an army and on the table. Yep. So um, we'll talk about the f- uh, the first way is the way you should never do it. The vanguard detachment. No, no, no. The first way is the auxiliary detachment. Okay. So um, I love that we have notes and then you decide to <laughs> not go with the notes. <laughs> So, by taking an auxiliary detachment, um, first of all, it uses up a detachment from your army. Mm-hmm. And if you're playing match play, typically, um, most of the match play events will allow you three. Uh, you have to spend one CP, um, or it's minus one CP for taking that detachment, and lets you pick an assassin. Um, we'll explain why in a second that that's the worst way to do it. Which is probably why I would have chosen to start with Vanguard. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, go on, then you can talk about the Vanguard. Uh, well, so the Vanguard, it basically gives you the detachment, and you can have... At least three. Um, and so you can have at least three assassins. They can be different assassins. Obviously, you can have three of the same, but only three of the same. But you can have up to six assassins in that detachment. Yeah, and uh, unlike normal Vanguard, which require a HQ, because this is um, it's specific to the rules, it's called Execution Force, which is the actual rule that um, the assassins use to essentially not require the HQ choice. Mm. So... You don't gain a CP for running them in that way. No, but you do if you take four and you have one of each type. Yep. So that's part of the execution force rule. So if you've just if you go three to six in any combination, then um, it doesn't there's cost nothing. you. Or it doesn't it doesn't cost yeah. you, but it doesn't benefit you. If you decide to take an execution force specifically, which is one of each of the four, then yeah, you actually do get the command benefit, which is plus one command point. Mm. Um, and there's value for for doing that potentially. Um, it depends on the rest of your army build and how much that one command point is valuable to you. Um, the third way, though, which kind of ties into the first, is using a stratagem called Operative Requisition Sanctioned. Mm-hmm. Now, it's got two values. One is one command point. The other is three command points. Three command points only applies to narrative play. Mm-hmm. The one command point applies to match play because in match play, you also have to spend points to um, use re- like reinforcement points to yeah, summon no, models. Just to clarify, when you're talking about the... Um, sorry, I can't remember the line that you just used, but to clarify, it, it's the cost is 1 CP or 3 CP. Yes. It's not that you're gaining 1 CP or 3 no, no. CP. Yeah. So in narrative play, you just spend the 3 CP and you don't have to uh, use... There's no such thing as reinforcement points in narrative or open play. You just get to summon units for free. In match play, this um, costs you 1 CP... And then you can only use it if your Warlord has the Imperium keyword. And you use it during the deployment step of the game. And you add one Assassin unit of your choice to the army. um, And it can only be used once for battle. So it essentially allows you to still spend the one CP that you would for an Auxiliary Detachment to add a single Assassin to your army. Yeah. What it does though... the Auxiliary Detachment and using this stratagem is if you only want to have one. Yeah. In theory, you could spend one command point to use the auxiliary detachment mm-hmm. and then you could spend another command point on the stratagem to get two. To get two, yeah. But I don't know that there's enough. If you're going to take two, you might as well take three. Mm. Um, so this is just the best way to get a single assassin into an army. Okay, and the reason that you think that this is the best way to get that single assassin is because it doesn't actually cost you a detachment. Yeah, in match play, most of the time you're limited to two or three is the usual number of detachments. And obviously, if you're building an army... I mean, you, you might have that spare detachment lurking around in your army, at which point it's no major loss. But more than anything else, it's about the flexibility this strategy provides. I was about provides. to say that's the other benefit is that you get to choose which assassin you're going to use at, at the start of the yeah deployment when you've actually seen what your opponent is rather than having to name it and list it. Yeah, so it just gives you the ultimate in flexibility where... If you want, uh, if you've got an enemy with a, a really high character count army like a Gene Steeler Cult, which you know has a dozen different characters these days, um, you can take a Vindicare. If you decide I need something that helps me clear huge hordes, I can take an Eversaw. If I need uh, a character killer for a, a sort of in a vulnerable target like a Farseer, then the Kalidus might be your choice. And if you if you go against like a Tyranid army with a huge volume of psychers and you don't have any of your own, then the Kalexus might become a really good mm. choice. So the flexibility of picking and choosing those at the point of time when you know what you're dealing with. I mean, there's no point in putting a Kalexus in the army because I'm going to have to face Eldar and then the Eldar player turns up with no Psykers. Mm. Um, or you don't face Eldar. Yeah. So that, that one CP stratagem just makes a whole bunch of sense. Even to the point where if you're running three in a Vanguard and you go, oh, I'm going to put a fourth in and you're not that interested in getting the execution force benefit... 
then take three Vindicare. And then you go, oh, you know what? I'm going to put a fourth Vindicare on my army because it lets you get around the rule of three. Hmm. Because the rule of three only applies to list writing, not what, what goes on the table. So you could, in theory, get four Vindicares in an army or four Eversaws in an army if you chose to. Yeah. Um, it's a neat way of really upping the ante and doubling down on abilities. But obviously, it's, it's a bit razor-edged because it can go the other way if it doesn't work. Yeah, so for people listening, I don't know if you've noticed, but Mike tends to see things very black and white. And so there's often sweeping statements such as, it's ridiculous, I don't know why anyone would ever use that, Um, you should never do this. And so that auxiliary detachment comes under that black and white thing that (laughs) nobody should ever do this. It doesn't make any sense to me. Unless you don't have the Imperium code um, keyword for your warlord. Well, then you can't take assassins anyway. Because of, the, because of the way match play works with keywords, the own, actually, I tell a lie. There is one loophole that allows Heh. you... See, I knew there'd be a loophole. It's, it's I a, see the world in grey. You see it black it's and white. The, well, the funny actually, thing is... Actually, I like to think, think I see it in colour, but anyway. This, this is actually a very black and white loophole, but it's, I, I assume it'll be closed relatively rapidly by an FAQ. At the moment, it's possible to put... Using this stratagem, it's possible to put an assassin into a chaos army. So it involves... You have to take uh, Cypher, the Fallen Angel, as your warlord. Now, he can't get a warlord trait, but he can be your warlord. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he has both the chaos and imperium keywords, as do his fallen angels. So what you end up having to do is take him and his fallen angels in a detachment, mm-hmm. along with a chaos army. Mm-hmm. Make him the warlord, and then obviously he doesn't get his warlord trait. And then at the start of the game, you actually meet the requirements, because the only requirement to access the stratagems is your army is battleforged, which it is. Mm-hmm. And it includes an Imperium detachment, which it does, because all the Fallen Angels and Cypher all have the Imperium keyword. So as long as you don't put anything else in that detachment that's Chaos, you have a, an Imperial detachment that is actually Chaos at the same time. At which point you can then spend one CP to put an Assassin in the army. Mm. And because it doesn't check Battleforged or any of the other army list stuff at that moment, because the game's already started, mm. it actually lets you put an Assassin in a Chaos army. Mm. Um, it's the most bizarre little, you, you, it's all legit and it all works, but it does require you to understand the step-by-step process and it feels a bit janky. Yeah. Um, and I actually don't know there's enough benefit in what you lose by making sight your warlord to justify doing it. But at the same time, it is in theory possible to, to, you know, pop a Vindicare or an Eversaur or whichever one you need into a Chaos Army. Yeah. Um, it just requires you to take certain steps that you probably don't want to do as a Chaos player because Fallen aren't particularly great. So <laughs> so having brought up that uh, about checking whether or not an army is Battleforged, that is one of the requirements to have access to these stratagems. Yep. Uh, a Battleforged Imperium Detachment and an Imperium Warlord. Yes. Now, I can't read my writing. Does that say any Imperium Detachment and any is important? Yes. Yes, it does. Which is obviously in relation to Cypher and his, because that is technically an Imperium Detachment. Because yep. it shares that as a keyword. Mm-hmm. So um, that's how you can kind of fudge things. <laughs> so the stratagems, obviously, we already spoke about the um, operative requisition sanctioned, and that can only be used once per battle. Yep. And the other stratagem that they have is priority threat neutralized. Yeah, this is kind of the way assassins gain command points. You spend one command point yeah. when you kill an enemy character, and you get two command points back. Do you have to spend the command point before you attempt to and so no this it specifically says use this after an enemy character model is slain okay cool so you know that you've just killed it and then you 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 spend one and get two back the trick is that so really you're just getting one i suppose you've got to have them left you've got to have the exact which i was about to say if you don't have one you can't do it even though you would get one as a result yeah and if you kill a warlord then you spend one get three back yep so it's a nice neat way of um late game CP farming because it's um, it sits outside the boundaries of um, the warlord traits that you get back command points in match play are limited to one per battle round. Mm-hmm. This actually lets you gain multiple multiple command points during yeah. the later stages of the game quite quickly. Mm-hmm. So it can be a point of putting in a, like a Vindicare into an army and you, you've got two command points and you go, oh, you know what? I re- if I had a third, I can rotate iron shields on my knight. All of a sudden you can get a kill get the extra command point and then bam you know you you can then rotate iron shields when your opponent was obviously in the head going oh you need three you've only got two i'm fu- i'm safe yeah so there's definitely an opportunity cost there that is well worth it mm. 
Mm. Um, so after that, there are then two pages per assassin. Yeah, so uh, two um, two stratagems per assassin. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. It's fine. Um, yeah. So each of the assassins get their own, their two. Unique and there aren't two pages of stratagems per assassin. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the vindicator gets double kill, which basically lets him shoot twice at two different opponents mm -hmm. um, in the same phase, which is cool. Um, Turbo penetrator is the other one that he gets access to, which basically lets him dump D three mortal wounds on a vehicle or monster, because a lot of his rules specify infantry. Yep. Um, it's a weird one because it actually leaves him in a position where cavalry, battle suit, and a few keywords actually mean that he can't hurt them reliably. Huh. Um, either even with this stratagem. So um, yeah, he's he's an interesting one where that's probably his biggest letdown is that he all of his rules, uh, his sniper rifle, and all the other stuff focus on infantry, and there are actually going to be characters in the game he doesn't engage effectively because they don't fit the infantry type, and then mm -hmm. you go to the turbo penetrator round stratagem and it only affects vehicles and monsters so you're kind of spending a command point to put d3 wounds on a big flying monster um, admittedly he does it reliably but mm. it's not necessarily the most efficient use for him um, the Calidus has two um, acrobatic and supreme deception acrobatic is done in the movement phase and you can advance and charge and um uh, until the start of the next battle round, subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target you. So, for one CP, she's hyper mobile. She already moves really well. She has the infiltrate. Um, she's got a, her um, polymorphine infiltration rules, and then she can advance and charge. And uh, you're also minus one to hit her. So I think that'll be a staple use for that particular model when you see it on the table. Mm -hmm. The other one, um, she has a rule in her, um, uh, which we'll cover in just a second, called Reign of Confusion. And this lets you do it a second time in the game. Mm. And it's still once per game. Um, and you can't use it in the first turn because her Reign of Confusion rule automatically happens turn one. But it does let you use it late game, which could actually be quite interesting to play. Um, and it uh, Reign, of, Reign of Confusion essentially means your opponent has to spend more command points to use stratagems. Mm. So I could easily see this being used in... Like it happens automatically round one and then just burning it. It's two command points. Spend it immediately turn two. Because the, your two cost uh, 50% of the time, they have to spend one more command point than they were expecting. Yeah. And I think the net result for that for turn one and two means you can bleed command points out of your opponent really quickly. Which obviously then has implications for the other three yeah. turns. Yeah. Um, the two for the Collexus are Pariah's Gaze and Soul Horror. Um, Pariah's Gaze basically is done as a shooting, it's done in the shooting phase. Um, the ranged weapons are increased to. Um, D3 damage, um, mm -hmm. which is nice. Unfortunately, the guns on the Kalexus aren't necessarily... Um, like the Animus Speculum is okay. It's not awesome. Um, but it does mean that if you desperately... like if um, Again, he's got a trigger for his gun that makes it shoot more often in his own rules. So if you're going to meet the conditions of that trigger to go from D3 shots to D6 shots and then up the damage from 1 to D3, then obviously you've got characters that potentially go from taking... Um, three damage to taking 18 damage, and that's yep. a big step up for one command point. Um, that's a really significant step up. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there's there's like a lot of variables in that as yeah. well, because to make that reliable, if you roll a one for your D6 shots, then you're going to spend another command point to re-roll that with mm -hmm. no guarantee of it being any better. Yeah. So a lot of the... And that's what I find with... And it could be in a, that's probably another whole episode on command points and stratagems for 40k, because I have... We'll write that down so we can remember <laughs> for next fortnight. <laughs> Um, Soul Horror is the other one. It's done at the start of the fight phase. Choose a Kalexus. Any units within three cannot be chosen to fight um, this charge phase until all other units have done so. And if one of those units has an ability that allows them to fight first, they instead fight in this phase as if they do not have that ability. So what you, um, what you end up doing with this is um, trying to get the assassin charged to then force the opponent not to fight first or going into a combat with something like Howling Banshees or um, there's a few units that always get to fight first. And then you can sort of pile in and deny them that ability to then try and kill them before they get to fight. Yeah. It's a bit niche because the Kalexus isn't necessarily the best combatant anyway. Um, he's good in comparison to a lot of things, but he's not the combat character from the four assassins. So there's there's some value with things like heroic intervention where you get charged, then heroically intervene with another unit and force the charging mm -hmm. unit to fight last, at which point the heroically intervening unit can cull them. And yeah. 
there's there's something there, but it's um it's a little bit niche for my taste, particularly for two command points. Um, then you the Eversource two are called hyper Meta- um, hyper metabolism and stim overload. Hyper Meta- uh, I can never say that metabolism. <laughs> um, it's the used at the start of any phase. Choose an assassin, uh, Eversource assassin until the end of that phase. Um, they basically gain a four plus feel no pain um, per wound, uh, excluding those resulted of a mortal wound. So it does make them really durable. They've got six wounds and a four up in vol, um, which is the most of any of the assassins. So giving them a feel no pain roll of four plus just means that they just keep going and going and going for one command point. Mm. Uh, and stim overload is done at the end of the fight phase. Choose an Eversor assassin. Um, it gets to fight again, but on a uh, you roll a dice after it's four, and on a one, two, or three, it suffers a mortal wound. Mm. Um, most of the fight against stratagems in the other codexes are three CP. This is only two, but you've got a 50-50 chance of taking a mortal wound. Um, it's pretty acceptable in my mind because he's got six wounds. He actually starts with one more than all the other assassins. So burning that in the early yeah. parts of the game to lose a wound, yeah, I can probably live with that. So, um, But it's two command points still. So you've got, really got to tie it into farming using the, um, the priority threat neutralized stratagem to make yeah. sure that you're keeping your command points up. And then ideally you're still farming via traditional means through um, relics and, and warlord traits. So, you know, all the stratagems are cool. Um, I think you'll see a lot of um, uh, double kill from the Vindicare. I think that'll be a pretty staple. Um, and I think Stim Overload and Hyper Metabolism are both probably ones you'll see regularly from the Eversaw. The, um, I think people are just going to put it in there more often because you can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> the Hyper thing. Um, I don't. I think people are going to overlook the Calidus, but I think Supreme Deception probably has a really decent place and then like i say the collexus ones are a little bit niche for my taste um so yeah there's some good stratagems there there's nothing super outlandish but there's nothing super garbage either they're just um really well thought out and well rounded and Mm. well priced so then we move on to the next couple of pages which are the data sheets so um they all are back to sharing common values yeah, most of the stats um, are pretty standard across the board. There are two minor exceptions. Mm. Um, so the the basic stat line reads like any really high level character from most other armies that uh, they get kind of jealous of. Yeah, and then there's three to five specifics. Is that not correct? Yeah. So um, the Calexus Assassin only has four attacks when the standard assassins have five, and the Eversaw has six. Mm-hmm. And the like I said uh, just just now, um, the assassin uh, Eversor assassin gets six wounds where everyone else has five. But other than that, they all move seven, two plus two plus strength and toughness four, leadership nine, six plus basic saving throw, and then they all have um, execution force independent operative, which basically means they don't get a warlord trait um, if they are your warlord, and that during deployment you can set this model up um, uh, essentially in deep strike. Yeah. And then Lightning Reflexes is a four-up invulnerable save. Um, so they all share those three common rules. Yeah. And then depending on which one you're talking about, um, like the uh, Calexus has four unique rules, the Eversaw has four, um, the Vindicare has five, and the Calidus has three. Hmm. Um, but they all have unique uh, war gear as well. Yeah. Um, and they're all they're sort of tied into all the background stories about their temples and how they like to do business on the, you know, how they go about sorting out the targets that they're assigned. So the Vindicares are, are all, it's two guns and a grenade. Um, the guns themselves are really heinous in terms of the game. Um, you know, you've got a, a rifle that's 72 inches, strength 5, neg 3, d3, can't take invulnerable saves with it, and it wounds infantry on twos. So again, if you find a character you really need to put down, at minus 3 AP, most characters are going to have a 5 up or a 6 up save at best. There's no invulnerable, so your storm shields and you know force fields don't save you. And then it's D3 damage, and he's going to wound you on twos if you're an infantry model. So mm. it's quite threatening to a lot of those support characters who only have sort of three to five wounds. Yeah. Um, and when you combine that with his special rule, which is called Headshot, um, once you've made an attack with a ranged weapon, roll the dice if a model suffered damage from that attack, but he's not been slain. On a 3+, plus, that model suffers a mortal wound. And if that model isn't still not slain, roll another d6. And on a 4+, plus, take a mortal wound. And if it's still not slain, roll another dice. And on a 5+, plus, take a mortal wound. Yeah. And then you can do it once more on a 6+. Plus. Mm. Um, realistically, on that 3+, plus, on that first roll, you can reliably guarantee... Well, not reliably, but and certainly not guarantee, but you can kind of bank on one to two mortal wounds out of him as well, per shot. 
So he's hitting on twos. If your infantry is wounding on twos, you're almost never going to get a save um, because on top of his um, neg three AP, he's also got a spy mask, which means you don't get the benefit of cover. So you mm. can't even park yourself in cover to try and get yourself a plus one because he yeah. doesn't care. Uh, and then he's got another rule that stacks on top of that, which is called um, faultless aim, which means as long as he doesn't move, he hits on twos all the time. doesn't matter how many modifiers you've got. So he's hitting on twos, winning on twos, almost no saving throw, D3 damage, and then stacks mortal wounds on top of that. It's it's pretty, pretty brutal. Hmm. Um, and on top of all of that... <laughs> He, um, he can always target characters, even if they're not the closest. And if he rolls a 6 to wound, instead of it being D3 damage, it's D6 damage. And at that point, he's just one-shotting medium characters without yeah. really trying. And he even then starts threatening, you know, six wound chapter masters have to pause and go, oh, I don't, I don't really want to go out and where he can see me because there is a slim chance that he'll just pulp you. Yeah. And then when you do try and kill the, the blighter, he's minus one to hit with ranged weapons. And if he's in terrain, it's actually minus two. So mm. shooting him is... Like, Tricky. You, you really have to get up close and pull him out of cover by close yeah. combat. And at that point, he does kind of fall flat because he's got no close combat weapons. So he's just fighting with his fists. He's got a lot of attacks and a good weapon skill, but he's ultimately he's punching you. So um, that's kind of where he falls over. Yeah. Um, the Calidus, um, it's worth talking about her special rules more than anything. Although, like I said to um, Richard when I was talking to him about his article. No, no, no. We're not up to that bit yet. Okay. We'll come to that in a minute. Okay? Anyway. This is why we have a plan. <laughs> Don't you jump around. <laughs> so the Calidus, um, again, three unique weapons. A, a cool pistol. It's actually not a pistol. It's an assault rifle that does um, D3 mortal wounds, which is... Like I say, it's a niche start. It's a nine-inch range, um, but she'll get some value out of that for single targets. She can't target independent characters, sadly. If she could, it'd be amazing. Um, her weapon in combat's only strength four, but it's neg three, two damage, and ignores invulnerable saves, which I don't think can be un- overstated how good that weapon is, Yeah. despite only being strength four. And then she's got poison blades, which let her do an extra wound, uh, additional attack and wound in close combat. It's a nice little extra sort of swing you get to, s- to sort of throw in there. Mm. Her main shtick, though, is... Um, can fall back and still shoot and charge in the same turn. So she's almost a Harlequin. You have to spend the command point to give her the ability to advance and charge, but she's hypermobile. Um, she doesn't have fly either, which probably slows her down in comparison to a Harlequin. Um, polymorphine is her cool deployment thing. So she basically gets the deep strike, but instead of it being nine inches from the enemy, it's D6 plus three. Mm-hmm. So it could be four inches away or it could be nine. Um, but when she's, um, you know, she's going to charge you anyway... Um, she can actually get into... You can think you've zoned her out at a nine-inch bubble and then all of a sudden she's not zoned out. Yeah. Um, and then a third rule is Reign of Confusion. So if you have any models with this ability in your army, then during the first battle round, roll a D6 each time your opponent spends command points to use a stratagem. Um, on a four-plus, your opponent must spend one extra command point to use that stratagem or else it has no effect and the CP so f- spent so far. Bless you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, and the CPs, they've already spent a lost. Um, but it only works in the first battle round, so it doesn't work against pre-game stuff. Um, and the fact you can then spend command points to make it happen in, in turn two as well, um, or turn three, I reckon, is probably when I'd use it. It's pretty, a uh, pretty pivotal turn most of the time. Mm. She's, a, she's got a lot of value, and I think a lot of people underestimate her. Um, the Eversaur is the next one. Um, his weapons look at, like... They're probably the weakest of the four. Um, generic Melter Bombs, Power Sword... Uh, plus one strength, minus one AP close combat weapon with rerolls to wound and a pistol that's four shots and rerolls to wound against infantry. His big deal is that when he dies, he explodes and deals mortal wounds. Um, if you try and, That does sound exciting. If you try and run away from him, he gets to shoot you for free. Um, that's a shame because I do always say that running away and hiding is a legitimate move. <laughs> no, if you try it with him, he'll shoot you. Right. Um, In the back. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and then the other two are combat oriented, which I really love. The first one is he gets to roll three dice instead of two when charging. Mm-hmm. Um, he still can't declare more than 12 inches away, but obviously he can move up to 18. So it gives you a much higher chance of making those 11 or 12 inch charges when you're rolling three dice instead of two. Mm. Um, and he also gets plus two attacks on the turn that he charges. So he goes from six attacks to eight attacks. Nice. And then you stack that with his other rule called Killing Rampage. Every time this model... Um, Every time an enemy model is slain as a result of an attack made by a melee weapon of this model, this model immediately makes one additional attack against the same unit. And these additional attacks cannot generate additional attacks. 
Um, this model can also consolidate up to six inches instead of the usual three. So the way that all kind of stacks out is you would declare charges against two different enemy units. Mm. Um, ideally, from nine inches away or greater, so any of their auto-hitting flamer weapons, which mostly are eight-inch range, can't auto-hit him. Take the Overwatch, charge in with your eight attacks, and then if you basic infantry, if they're one wound infantry, then you wave around your Neuro Gauntlet at strength five with rerolls to wound and minus one AP. You'll definitely get kills mm. against anything but the toughest units. Then you get a bunch of free attacks... And then you spend two CP on his stratagem to let him fight a second time. Yeah. And with a bit of luck, you've killed the first unit. So then you can, when you spend those two CP, you can pile yeah, into the second it. unit because yeah. you've got a six inch consolidate. And then you get to double fight again because mm. you can stack his free attacks. So he can really blend units. Like yeah. he'll he'll go in quite happily. In, you know, uh, Gene Steeler, Coltus, Guard, um, Gantz, um, any sort of light infantry. He's just going to blend. With eight attacks, hitting on twos, and then um, he'll generally be wounding on threes. They'll be getting six plus on no saves, and then he's getting free attacks. He can easily kill ten in yeah. a round of combat. So he struggles, though. Ironically, he actually struggles against killing hard targets. Where mm. you know one of the the really powerful characters, he'll just kind of bounce off because he doesn't have any way of penetrating their invulnerable saves. And his AP isn't that flash to begin with. So he'll deal wounds to them and he'll sneak the odd wound through, but there's no multi-damage there. Yeah. So he's definitely a um, a command squad killer or a unit killer more than anything else. Mm. Um, it's one of the reasons I actually rate the Calidus as much as I do. Um, the last one's the Calexus. Um, I really find the weapons a bit underwhelming. One's an Assault D3, which can become Assault D6 when you're within 18 inches of a Psyker. It should be noted it's only enemy Psykers unlike his main rule. so I was going to say, I think that's one of the interesting things with the main rule that goes with that one. Yeah, so he's got a rule called Abomination, Yeah, um, which can never be targeted or affected by psychic powers in any way. And psychers, not enemy, just generic psychers that are within 18, subtract two from psychic tests and deny the witch tests. So he's got an aura that affects every psyker, but his gun only gets better within range of enemy psychers. Yes, but I think it's important that you know that um, the abomination applies to any psyker, yeah, including those. Yeah, including those on your own armies. So. Yeah. Um, the psych out grenades are just a bit like I don't know why you'd ever use them. To be perfectly honest. Um, Again, black white. Let's not try find some grey. <laughs> Uh, each roll of a six, to, uh, each hit roll of a six made for an attack with this weapon inflicts one mortal wound instead of normal damage. If the target is a psyker or a demon, it's D three shots at six inches at strength two, compared to its main gun, which is far better at minus four AP strength five. Like I, I actually can't think of a reason why you use the grenade. If you're listening to this and you can think yeah, of a reason, point please, it out. Let me know. please point it out. <laughs> um. He, has, he does have a cool rule, uh, Life Drain, which means you can't take saving throws um, when he attacks in combat unless they're invulnerable. So he does kill infantry pretty well. Um, he always, when you attack him, he always counts... You, sorry, you, when you're trying to attack him, count as weapon skill and ballistic skill 6+, plus, which means you're essentially only hitting him on 6s. Um, and he can always target a character that is a psyker, even if it's not the closest. Um in addition, this model can make an attack with its psych out grenade in the same phase that it uses its speculum. So if you can get close enough, you obviously will throw that grenade on top of its main gun. But at six inches away, you're, you're pretty close. You're certainly not doing it the turn he deploys. You're going to have to drop in, shoot, and then the following turn move closer to the target before you can throw that grenade. Yeah. So I definitely think that all four of them have their spot, but I do have some favourites out of that little group which is a beautiful segue into the next part where as we've spoken about one of our writers um rich did, yeah um yeah, well he writes as danger rod so i don't like using his name because it's all a bit <laughs> weird um so yeah he's obviously written an article about the assassins and he ranked them um so highest to lowest with ever saw first Calexus, vindicare and calidus you, of course, disagree. Of course. Venomantly, loudly. Not, not and... necessarily venomantly, but... Oh, no, no. It was venomantly. <laughs> we were talking about this in the car before we decided that this was going to be the podcast episode. And the thing was, he's wrong. No, it was not. Oh, yes, it was. 
I've already told him that he's wrong today. Right, just so he knows, <laughs> so when he hears this. Um, no, no, see, when I tell him he's wrong, I explain why I think he's wrong. Right. So that's okay. Well, that's what you're going to do now, yeah. isn't it? So your ranking would be, now, as much as he was sure that um, that Richard was wrong, he then did change his mind a few times about his ranking, so he wasn't that black and white about it, but he's put down Vindicare, Eversaw, um, Calidus, and, and then Calexis. And even that, like I actually think those first three um, are hyper-situational. I think that any one of the, th- the apart from the Calexis, any one of the other three is a, a good choice, um, particularly if you're only using the one CP to add one to your army. All three of them have a place. Um, the Calexis is too niche for me and doesn't do enough in that niche. Mm. So, it, like I said earlier, if you really want to kill multiple light characters from turn one, put a Vindicare in the army and let him just sit in a ruin and shoot all game and he'll take out mm, probably three to four mid-level or low-level characters across the course of the game. And if they're buff characters, that can have a significant and profound impact as the game goes on, particularly for things like um, Space Marine Ancients or Homoculi for the Dark Eldar, anything that's going to give multiple buffs. And and that's a two plus, isn't it? To hit and to wound, yeah. yeah. So it's a relatively... It's, yeah, well, that's it. I mean, Richard's um, <laughs> Richard's not a fan of single-shot weapons because he tends to roll ones for them, in his opinion. So mm. um, Statistically, that should yeah. be what happens. Um. You know, I think I think that rely like if you expect him to kill a model every turn, you're wrong. But I think expecting three to four kills a game over six or seven turns is probably a reasonable expectation. Mm. And if you're picking the right targets, the the key for him is going to be picking what you should be shooting at. Because with the, with the the way his stats and everything work, you'll be suckered into shooting at the biggest, hardest infantry model you can get your hands on. Mm. But it's going to take at least two, probably three shots to kill those characters. And even then, if you roll a one on the D3 damage, it's going to take three or four. Yeah. He's much better off picking on the Warlock than the Farseer. He's much better off picking on the Ancient than the Chapter Master. Um, a lot of the time, because those mid-level and low-level characters are the, the support characters that the armies really want to function. Um, the Eversaw... Um, I think it depends on what the rest of your army is because if you're trying to kill screens and blend light troops and you're playing a guard army with artillery and las guns, I don't know what the Eversaw does for you that your army doesn't already do. Yeah. Um, I feel like the Eversaw... The Eversaw is a nice, safe default choice. He'll always be useful. He's always going to do something. So if you're not sure what to take, he's probably a safe default choice. Yeah. But I actually think that and when you start looking at combat, if you're actually going hunting for characters, the Calidus is a much better choice because she ignores invulnerable saves in combat. She's only strength four, but she's got a good AP, two damage weapon. You know, um, if she charges a... Um, she's got five attacks, hitting on twos. So if she charges a Space Marine character, she's got she's probably going to get four or five hits. Yeah. She's wounding on four, so she's going to get two... She might even sneak three through mm. in wounds. If she's got five hits, three is possible. Mm. And that's six damage with no saves of any kind. That's yeah. a dead Space Marine character. So the the Eversaw won't do that. Mm. So I think um, I think the Calidus is much more like a scalpel where you put it in the army because you want that short-range deep strike. You want it to land somewhere and to kill a specific target. Things like a Farseer. Um, yeah. Where the Vindicare is killing the support characters, the Calidus picks the hard target mm. and you might have to burn CP on her for rerolls to hit or rerolls to wound to yeah. get those kills but the investment that you're making is going to hopefully be three times what she's worth and if she dies immediately following that you don't care because you've you've got Slay the Warlord or you've achieved a particular character kill where you're heartless what? you don't care no I don't care <laughs> do you have no emotional attachment to your models? Uh, some of them but this model isn't built or painted yet, so, so ask me when or that's... Or bought. I no, know it's, it's bought. Yeah, no, I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's bought. Um, the biggest problem I have of all four of them is the Calexus, which I know Richard really rates. I think that the penalty for what it does to your psychic army, and obviously if you haven't got psychers, you don't care, but it doesn't kill psychers well because none of its weapons ignore invulnerable saves. So if you're fighting a basic Space Marine Librarian, yeah, it's going to kill the Librarian. Yeah. But... Any of the really important psychers, things like Hive Tyrants um, or the Swarm Lord, Farseer, Eldrad, um, 
you know, any of the proper high-end psychers will have invulnerable saves, will be protected and screened, hmm. and the ever uh, sorry, the Kalexis just doesn't have the tools to get through the screens to get to its target. Yeah. Um, it might do, um, but my first pass is if I'm trying to kill one of those characters, why am I not just taking the Kalidus, which is more likely to do it and be able to be where it needs to be to achieve that goal? So, um, yeah, I, I actually think that I mean, there was a time when the Kalexus was the be-all and end-all of 40k, particularly in 7th edition. And I feel like the um, uh, each one of them has had its time in the sun over the the, yeah. the years. And I think that most that people... has passed. I, I th- definitely think most people will either go Eversaw or Vindicare because they're easy plugins that will just do work. Yeah. And I think that the Kalexus will start off as a default choice for a lot of players for anti psycho duties and then it'll quickly become a... Well, it's not really doing anything for me. Or mm. as soon as you go to a tournament and you face a Tau army with no psychers, or yeah. its its role is going to be determined by your own who you're playing. Mm. Which is why I think the Calidus is going to be this sort of sleeper that gets plugged into armies, and then all of a sudden you're down a Farseer or you're down a character that this thing's just popped up beside and murdered. But I guess that's why um, the operant requisition sanctioned oh, the, yeah. stratagem works well if you are just going to take one because it does give you that ability to be able to slot whichever oh, one absolutely. you want in there based on what's across the table. But I mean, I've, I've got visions of running three Calidus together mm. in a Vanguard. What's that? 8, 16, 24. It's 255 points for mm-hmm. the three of them and dropping them all in together. If you've got a character, a unit of characters has to go, oh, that's not going to be fun. Because yeah. even if even if she's only like a demon prince, she only wounds on fives. But when there's three of them, 15 attacks, hitting on twos, wounding on fives with no saves yeah. and two damage each, that demon prince is dead. Mm. And admittedly at that point, their cost is probably higher than the prince. But you now have to deal with three of these five wound four plus invulnerable save models in your lines and if you don't they're going to do it again and again and again so what was interesting for me as we're chatting about this is when we first went through your list of rankings calidus was last yeah it's only as i've had time to process yeah that's it and when we were looking at it you were like she certainly looks like the coolest model but she's the least effective and she's Mm. you know the least useful that kind of thing and now you're talking about running three and yeah it's it's definitely one that i mean from the time we you easily miss um yeah i misjudged it absolutely yeah i mean we we've had about uh six hours between doing that that conversation and then the recording and in that time i've been sort of stewing on it trying to figure out how it looks on the table yeah and i think that's kind of be the that, that's going to be the discrepancy because on paper she looks kind of plain, and certainly doesn't have all the cool fancy rules that the um, the Vindicare, Vindicare and the has. Um, and Amazon. the Eversol have. Yeah. But I actually think the fact that she she literally just becomes a scalpel where you drop her in in a place that your opponent thinks is safe and isn't, mm. and then she goes in, does her job, and when they kill her, she's eighty five points. She doesn't necessarily lose you a great deal of your army and if she goes in and kills a 150 or 200 point character that's an exceptionally good trade yeah even if she just goes in and kills um you know ancients and banner bearers and uh, apothecaries and that sort of thing she's still going in and doing work that far outweighs her her cost to me yeah and the fact that she can do it so reliably is um yeah it's it's an interesting one where um the more i've thought about it the more i love the idea of running multiple and just it's so, you know, she can fall back and still shoot and still charge. She's got a strategy that lets her advance and charge and make her harder to hit. Um, the pistols are okay. And if you can get her close enough so that her target character mm-hmm. is the closest model, then it's a nine-inch range. Roll it hits on twos and roll three dice. And if that number is equal to or greater than the target's leadership, which for most characters is eight or nine, so you need th- three dice needing say nine or higher on three yeah. dice which is average yeah you take d3 mortal wounds and then she charges in and ignores all your armor save and you know it's i could definitely see like even a single one becomes a serious problem and if two or three of them turn up you start having to go oh that's not oh dear that, that's not good if particularly for anything that's not a vehicle yeah 
So I finished all of my notes about it, <laughs> um, which brings me to what are your overarching thoughts about it? I'm really pleased that they, they did this in White Dwarf. I think there's a lot of, um, like I said in the intro, there's a lot of potential for them to then use this as a stepping stone to kind of move the game forward. It also lets them test bed new... There's two assassins that are mentioned in the stories that haven't got rules or models. Mm. And it'd be really easy for them to go, oh, we're going to put a Venom in, a, a, Ven, a Venice assassin in, uh-huh. um, which are only mentioned in passing in this entry. Yeah. But there's a Horace Heresy book that features them heavily. Yeah. Um, release one new model, release the data sheet for it, two stratagems for it, and... You're good to go. You, there you go. You can plug it straight into the army. Yeah. And then just update the execution force rules to say, hey, if you add all five of them, you might get two command points. Yeah. Um, so I think it gives them a lot of potential and variety going forward if they do decide to add new, new assassin types. And then, like I say, there's at least two that are mentioned that have no rules. Hmm. Um, so that's that's a, an exciting possibility. I think that the fact that two of the assassins of the four, and of course it's the Vindicare and the Eversaw, hmm. that are sold out on the Australian web store at the yeah. moment, is a testament to what the community thinks of those two models in particular. Um, and I definitely think that, at least in the short to medium term, there's going to be a lot of Imperial players who've never been able to summon, in inverted commas, yeah. um, saving 85 points just to have the novelty of bringing along the four assassins and picking which one they want at the start of each game. Yeah. Um, you might even have players going, oh, you know what, I don't need two of them. I'll just bring an Eversaw and a Vindicare and kind of mm. call it a day. Um, and then you're only spending 100 bucks instead of 200 bucks on the models. Yeah. Um, but I do think that a lot of Imperial armies will just go, cool, I'm going to include an assassin, so I'm just going to leave 85 points out and be done with it. Yeah. But I also think there's going to be... Um, we saw at um, Oz Masters just gone, mm. um, WA's Pete Platel took three assassins mm. using the old index rules, so not the current ones. Yeah. Uh, he finished ninth out of 30. And then there was another player who, <laughs> whose army consisted of, I think it was 11 assassins and then knights. And um, it was it was an so he took uh, six in one detachment, five in another vanguard. Uh, okay, I mean, and then how did he manage to get eleven in there? And then yet? his third detachment was a knight's detachment. Right. And that army just really appeals to me um, because it's so just bonkers. It's it's that one that you look at and go, oh my! Like I've either got to deal with knights or these untargetable, yeah. hard to kill assassins. So there's a lot of fun to be had there for those left wing armies, and they'll do. They'll do reasonably well because some armies just can't cope with that. Mm. Uh, particularly when all the weapons that you're trying to use to kill the knights are getting sniped or getting charged and the, you know, the assassins are running interference. So um, there's definitely something there that's cool and I don't know how many tournaments it'll win, but it's certainly a, an interesting army to put on the table. But yeah. I don't have enough assassins to do it. So. Oh no, you do. No, I don't. You don't need any more. I, I definitely might need uh, more. No, I don't need <laughs> <laughs> Got a giant Titan here that needs to be finished before yeah, yeah, you yeah. even start thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm allowed to think about it though, and that's the point. Not yet, you're not. Um, okay, have we finished this section? <laughs> yeah, look, I think so. I think yes, overall, yeah, you're going to see assassins in a lot of Imperial armies going forward, and I think once it all settles down, um, they're not going to disappear. They're going to be something that um, it certainly helps fill gaps for the Imperial armies that they they do need. So um, yeah, expect a Vindica or an Eversaw in half the armies you face that are Imperial and you can't go too far wrong. Hmm. Cool. Anyway, um, we'll wrap it up um, in just a second with our final thoughts. Beautiful. So, I'm not going to do the we're back again, because um, <laughs> that's that's Emma's shtick. It's going to be a thing, you know that. You're going to have to keep doing it now. I do it all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're... Um, this is sort of our first codex review, if you like, and mm. it's probably... It it's an index, to, actually. Well, that's true. Um, it We've never done a codex review. No. Still. <laughs> <laughs> because there's only four units, it's let us be quite in-depth with some of the tactics and strategies and I can easily see us if you picked up a Harlequin Codex which I have a plan to do a review on there's only about seven units so it's 
it's going to take longer, still manageable. but it's not terrible. But as soon yeah. as you start looking at um, like a Space Marine Codex where there's literally 80 units, yeah, we'd obviously have to look at a format that, Ma- makes that. makes that work. And, you know, there might have to be some, okay, we're going to look at this purely from a competitive point of view. So we're not going to look at these 60 units. We're going to focus on these 20. Tell you what, why don't we wrap up today's episode and we'll think about that for <laughs> if and when it happens. So if you've got a codex you'd like to see us talk about specifically, um, let us know in the comments on our Facebook page, on the website. Um, you can send us a contact us via the website as well. You can send us a PM on Facebook. You can hit me up on Twitter. All the usual spots. Twitter, really? I do, do check, check Twitter. It? I check it every day. Oh, okay. You, just because you don't. You're right, I don't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if, you, if you've got a particular codex you'd like us to, to check out first, um, by all means, let us know. Um, we might even ask our patrons and let them have first say for the first one we do. But, um, yeah, until the next episode, thank you very much for listening. I hope mm-hmm. you enjoyed our ramblings through the Index Imperialis Assassins. And um, I suppose once we, there are plenty of assassins coming to our next 40k event. So maybe uh, the intro for the next episode will cover just how many we saw and um, maybe the winning list features them. Who knows? Mm. We'll find out in a couple of days. Um, yeah, so we got anything else? No, it's just that you've got it wrong every single time. It's Assassin's Index Imperialis. <laughs> and on that note, thanks very much for listening. <laughs> Happy gaming, everyone. You've been listening to the Objective Secured podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, you can visit our website, objectivesecured.com.au. You can find us on Facebook, Facebook forward slash Objective Secured, or you can email us obsec at optusnet.com.au. Thanks for listening. <laughs>